So this is going to be part two of our video series on how to read an ABG. And what I'm going to be talking about in this video is going over this diagram and talking about all the different types of causes of acidosis versus alkalosis. And we're breaking it down between respiratory and metabolic. And so in the last video, in the first video, I talked about how do you actually determine whether or not something is metabolic versus respiratory, as well as acidotic and alkalotic. So if you don't know, definitely check out the first video. But the first thing that we're going to do is kind of break it down in terms of an ABG analysis when we're dealing with acidosis and alkalosis. What are the different causes. Once we've actually figured out that it is a metabolic acidosis or it is a metabolic alkalosis, what are the different causes? So the first thing is acidosis versus alkalosis. We're going to break it down by pH. And then once we have an acidosis, remember I was talking about it's respiratory or metabolic. In the respiratory setting, really what it's going to be determined by is the PaCO2. If the PaCO2 is high, it's going to mean that we're uh, holding on to all this extra CO2 and it's going to lead to a respiratory acidosis. So in broad strokes, a respiratory acidosis is caused by hypoventilation. You're holding on to all this extra CO2. Right, we have all this extra CO2, it's causing hypoventilation and leading to a respiratory acidosis. So things like CNS depression, some type of airway obstruction that's leading to that you cannot ventilate properly, a pneumothorax, COPD, restrictive lung disease, obviously these are going to be more in the chronic setting. We didn't talk about acute versus chronic um, respiratory acidosis, but these would be more in the chronic setting and these would be more likely more be in the acute setting. The next thing is going to be a metabolic metabolic acidosis. And remember, once we figure out that it's a metabolic acidosis, we're going to want to do an anion gap. And if the anion gap is normal, then we're going to be start thinking about diarrhea or renal tubular acidosis. And if it's high, then this is going to be our mud pilers uh, mnemonic. After we actually figure out that it is an anion gap acidosis, what we're going to want to break it down to now is whether or not there's a delta gap or delta delta gap that you may have heard of. And so if it is low, if the delta gap is low, remember the delta gap is the equation is the patient's anion gap minus the normal anion gap, which is around 8 to 12. And then adding into the bicarb, if this is low, then that means we're going to have another non-anion gap acidosis which is everything over here. And if it's high, that means we're also going to have some type of metabolic alkalosis in addition to our anion gap acidosis. And I'll talk about that in a second. For more educational resources like our HMP notebooks, check out medicalbasics.com. So when we're dealing with alkalosis, it's kind of just the reverse of the acidosis scenario. When we're dealing with respiratory alkalosis, that means we're essentially blowing off too much CO2. So we have too little CO2, and that's leading to um, an alkalotic state. The only real thing is any type of hyperventilation. What would cause hyperventilation? Things like anxiety or if you're just breathing too much or breathing too hard can lead to some type of hyperventilating state. Another very common setting that you can think of is in the ICU, right? These type of respiratory alkalosis or even respiratory acidosis can be self-induced, not self-induced by the patient, but self-induced by us. So when you're thinking about patients who are being ventilated, this is a very common scenario where these things can go wrong. When you can hypoventilate or hyperventilate somebody in the ICU when they're on some type of supplementary ventilation. So the last one that I'm going to mention is going to be metabolic alkalosis. And there are other causes, alkali consumption, barters, gidomans, which have to do with the hereditary kidney diseases. But the most common one is going to be vomiting that we're going to be thinking about. And why is this the case? Well, when you vomit, you're vomiting up all of our stomach acid. So that's going to be all this acidic content that you're getting rid of, and that's why it's going to cause an alkalosis. And this can lead to a metabolic alkalosis. So this is a great summary of how we have to deal with any type of primary acidosis or primary alkalosis. This is the best way to kind of approach it. We deal with our pH, figure out whether or not it's low or high. Then we have to figure out whether or not it's going to be a respiratory acidosis or whether or not it's going to be an alkalosis. And remember, I was talking, what I like to do is just take one component. Look at the PaCO2. If it's high in acidosis, then it's got to be a respiratory cause. And if it's low in alkalosis, then it's got to be a respiratory cause, a respiratory alkalosis. And then if it's a metabolic acidosis, we kind of break it down by anion gap and delta gap. And then if it's not, then we can just kind of deal very solely with alkalosis. And there's other components that you've probably been taught, like an osmo gap. Um, and also you can do a urine chloride. But in, in practice, nobody ever uses these tests. 
that's why I didn't include them within this diagram. So hopefully this helps. And in other videos, we'll actually go through examples and we'll talk about um, kind of when you have multiple problems going on. You have a primary metabolic acidosis and you have an additional thing that's going on on top of that. Be sure to check out our website, medicalbasics.com, for more educational resources like our medical ID cards. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.